Next, it's all about Westerville. First, a look at the Anti-Saloon League. Then, a famous house on the Underground Railroad. And lunchtime beer in the heart of temperance country. That's next on Columbus Neighborhoods. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by at American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarter city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation, smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. CODA, keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortine, marketing and communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. We're on the campus of Otterbein University in Westerville. Now some would say we're on hollow ground because national battles over slavery and saloons were fought here. It was a very different time. Our first story focuses on the Anti-Saloon League. Alcohol was thought of as a destructive force for individuals and for the health of the family. The call for prohibition was strongest here in Westerville, with thousands of flyers, brochures, and songs mailed through the U.S. Postal Service on a daily basis. Our first story takes a look at how the movement became policy, one document at a time. In the early part of the 1800s, alcohol had become a huge problem in the country. There was much higher percentage of alcoholism, and as we get past the Civil War and we've solved the problem of slavery, suddenly people are beginning to think about alcohol as a crisis in the country. A number of organizations come into being immediately after the American Civil War dealing with this issue. Probably the most important one initially is the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which comes into being in 1874. Arguing in favor of the temperate use of alcohol, they will also be strong advocates of women's rights on the one hand, and also equal rights for African Americans. In other words, it's a widespread sort of movement. A more direct kind of movement emerges with the Anti-Saloon League of America. They had one cause, and that was to rid the country of the saloon. The Anti-Saloon League was founded in 1893 at Oberlin by the Reverend Howard Hyde Russell, and they came to Westerville in 1909. They had been looking for a place to build their own printing headquarters. So the citizens of Westerville found out about this and they formed a board of trade. The board of trade purchased land on South State Street that had an 1850s house on it. And they then sent the postmaster to Washington, D.C. to take the offer of this gift of land and a building to the Anti-Saloon League leadership to persuade them to bring the printing headquarters here. And it worked huge celebration in the city. The church bells were ringing, the people were pouring out into the streets when they heard the news that the League was bringing their printing operation here. And by the time the Anti-Saloon League reaches its peak, it is really the dominant organization in that town, employing large numbers of people with a rather large printing press. So it has a major economic, political, and social impact, not just on Westerville, but on Central Ohio as a whole. The League printed the American Issue newspapers that went all over the country. They also printed state editions. They had their own magazines, flyers, books. They had posters. 
The Anti Saloon League is an extraordinarily successful model for how to market something. In this case, it's an idea, the prohibition of the manufacture, sale, or distribution of alcohol. But if you take a close look at the Anti Saloon League, the way they go about doing this, they're a forerunner of modern marketing methods that are used through most of the 20th century. They use the color red because our eyes are always drawn to the color red. They use statistics. Now I can't tell you whether those statistics were gathered using scientific methods that we would approve of today, but they knew that that would frame our opinion of the information they were giving us. So we're in a room of the 1850s house that was the headquarters of the Anti-Saloon League. We have turned this into a museum to share their history through the printed things they made. And on this desk, we have a lot of examples of the flyers they printed. We have one in here that says, Daddy's in there and our shoes and stockings and clothes and food are in there too and they'll never come out. And it shows the young girl and boy outside the saloon waiting for their father to come. This one is really amazing. It says the Titanic carried down 1,503 people. Drink carries off 1,503 men and women every eight days in the year. They're not saying that the Titanic went down because of alcohol, but a year after the Titanic goes down, they print this showing that their statistics compared to how many people were lost on the Titanic. 1913 was a key year for them. They decided to join forces with the WCTU and the Prohibition Party and call for a constitutional amendment to stop the liquor traffic. It's at that point that they start sending speakers out in great numbers. They're printing all this material. They're going into the churches for fundraising. What brings it all together is World War I, because World War I puts in place the temporary prohibition of the sale, manufacture, and distribution of alcohol, which will then be pushed forward from World War I, moving toward an absolute amendment so they got the constitutional amendment passed, and I think their feeling at that point was they were going to continue to be a force in the country. But in actuality, once this is passed, they become kind of passe. There it starts to be a battle by 1925 between two factions of the League. One is this enforcement faction. The other is an educational faction. And one of the proponents of that is Ernest Charrington, and he was head of all the printing here. And Ernest Charrington liked to say that the alcohol problem will not be solved in the next election, but in the next generation. And the enforcement people won that power struggle. In 1929, when the economy fails, suddenly the case can be made that we need the jobs that producing alcohol would bring, and we need the tax revenue that taxing alcoholic products would bring the federal government. So when you get to 1932, both parties are running on a platform of getting rid of prohibition. The Anti-Saloon League finds itself at the end of prohibition, essentially a cause without a possibility. Howard Hyde Russell, the founder of the League, their, their father figure, goes on national radio and he says, this is not a dry funeral. This is only a period of mistaken opinions. And if we cannot have the whole loaf, we'll take a slice. If we cannot have a slice, we'll take a crust. If we cannot have a crust, we'll take a crumb. So how far have they fallen to suddenly being willing to take a crumb? The remnants of the League are still here in the 70s, trying to fight the battle. They continue to publish for a time, but then the money totally dries up for that. So it's rather a sad story in the end. When you have a group like the Anti-Saloon League that's been so influential in the country, it's easy for their things to just go by the wayside because their cause went by the wayside. But this stuff is 
really relevant today with the things we're looking at today in terms of legalizing certain drugs. The fight on tobacco, yes, it's old, but it's relevant to what goes on today and the methodology that the Anti-Saloon League used to appeal to our senses. And the lobbying they did for a single cause is much like you see with gun proponents, abortion proponents, people who vote on a single issue. It's the same thing today. Next, the Hanby House, a stop on the Underground Railroad. Then, lunch at Uptown Deli and Brew, where craft beer is in demand. Temperance and anti-slavery sentiments were strong here in Westerville. And as the quest for temperance heated up, the Underground Railroad saw many homes open for escaping slaves. Jeff Darby visits the home of William Hanby, a temperance reformer, a staunch abolitionist, and a co-founder of Otterbein University. We're in downtown Westerville, about 15 miles north and east of downtown Columbus. It's an old community, almost as old as Columbus itself. The, the area was settled about 1810. It also uh, had some underground railroad experience, and we're just about to visit the Hanby House, Benjamin Hanby House, uh, here on uh, West Main Street in Westerville, home of Benjamin Hanby, who was a uh, who wrote music. He was a, he was a lyricist and a musician. Uh, and he wrote some songs I think you'll, uh, you'll find familiar. Hi, I'm Jeff Darby. Hi, I'm Pam Allen. Nice Welcome to, to Hamby House. Thank you very much. It's nice to meet you. I haven't been here before, I have to admit. Well, and I'm glad for the chance. It's a treasure here in Westerville and has uh, repercussions from this history go around the world. Seems. And it looks like maybe this is the kitchen. I see a big stove. This, yes indeed, was the kitchen, and believe it or not, one of the daughters in the household said that they always planned for 16 for dinner in this space. So that's like cooking a Thanksgiving dinner every yeah, day Yeah, every week. single night. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Well, let's see some more of the house. Right, I, I, I can tell already it's a great place. Was this a parlor? Is this where they'd entertain? This is the parlor, and the parlor was for entertaining. Um, that was for the happy times. We have the, the patriarch and the matriarch on the wall, mm -hmm. Bishop and his wife, Ann Miller Hanby. Bishop was instrumental in getting um, Otterbein founded to admit women and blacks on an equal status with the white male Well, this students. was a progressive community. It had history it in the Underground Railroad. Of course, it's temperance history. Uh, so a very progressive community and kind of out on the frontier at the time, at least the time and, it was settled. And the Hamby family had been involved in the Underground Railroad when they lived in Rushville and Circleville, and they continued that activity once they moved here to Westerville. An important underground feature in this room is the vase in the window with the three flowers. That was a secret signal system here in Westerville. Those who were part of the Underground Railroad knew that the number of blossoms in the vase represented how many slaves were currently in hiding here. Anyone else just thought Ann Hanby had some pretty flowers in the window. Now, Benjamin Hanby was a musician. While Ben was a student at Otterbein, he wrote his first song that was published, Darling Nellie Gray. And then um, he continued in his musical career after college. And when he lived over in New Paris, Ohio, is when he wrote his Christmas song, Santa Claus, that we know today is up on the housetop. So I know there's more house. I know there's another room anyway on the first floor. Should we look at some more? Not a lot of house, but I'm happy to show you what we've got. Well, there's, <laughs> there's a big bed here, so clearly it's a bedroom, but I'm guessing maybe that wasn't its original use. That would be a good guess. This is the original kitchen of the house. This front window was originally a door into the kitchen. Okay, so there were two front doors, right. one, one for the kitchen, one to go to the parlor where guests would come in so they didn't have to pass through the kitchen. Correct. Okay. So this was the bedroom for Bishop and his wife, Anne, and the youngest son, Sammy, was only 18 months when they moved here, so he probably spent some time. And then everybody else upstairs. Yes. So let's go see. All right. So this was another bedroom. There are two rooms up here, right? And right. This is another bedroom. Just this right was at the, the girls' bedroom. Okay. Uh, and you have historical displays in this room now. We do. It's more of a museum room now. We've got um, some of Ben Hanby's sheet music on the wall. And our current exhibit is about the descendants of the Hanby family. So in this case, um, are the descendants of Ben and Kate. Was this his flute? 
This was his flute. Um, he saved up money for this and bought it, and he crafted the case himself. Well, there's one more room. Mm-hmm. So this was the boys' room. Yes, four boys um, grew up in this room. In this corner is a desk that was made by Ben when he was a student here at Otterbein before his family had well, moved he to He really Western. was a skilled woodworker. He was very skilled. And when you think they also knew leather work, et cetera, I, yeah. you know, he, he had quite a few talents. Well, the house is so well preserved. It's, you know, it's really in its historical condition with historical furnishings. But how was it saved? I mean, when did the Hanby family leave, and, and who were some of the later owners? The Hanby family um, moved out in the 1870s. And then in 1889, a local man named Squire Faust purchased the house. And his story is interesting because Squire Faust was a slave in North Carolina through the end of the Civil War. And then he came to Westerville and ended up buying this house which had harbored fugitive slaves and the Faust family lived here longer than the Hambys did. And the whole house is just full of terrific stories. The stories go on and on. The more research we do, the more interesting stories So the find. story is constantly evolving as you learn new things. It is. And uh, some people say, well, I was at Hamby House 20 years ago. I, I know. And I go, you don't know yeah. what we've learned since then. Time to visit again. And and yes. we should mention it's it's done, uh, the, the house is run in cooperation with the Westerville Historical Society. Is that correct? Westerville Historical Society is the management partner with Ohio okay. History Connect. Thanks so much for the tour. I mean, I, as I mentioned early on, I hadn't been here before, much to my shame, but I've seen it now and it's a wonderful place. Well, we have special events through the years, so please come back. And I hope everybody in town will do the same thing. Thanks so much Thank for the tour. Time. And next door, you got to eat lunch at a brewery along Temperance Row, right? I sure did, and it was great. Times have definitely changed, my friend, but Uptown Deli and Brew is very proud of its link to the past. We're in historic Westerville today at Uptown Deli and Brew. I'm here to talk with Tony Kabalowski, owner of Temperance Row Brewing. He's got some great stories about ushering craft brewing into the birthplace of the nation's temperance movement. Brewing is done in the back of the building where you'll find pilsners, IPAs, and ales brewed right on the spot. You'll find the deli in the front of the building. There are signature sandwiches with Italian cold cuts and house fried potato chips. The fig about it with prosciutto, fig jam, and goat cheese is my choice for lunch. Yeah, that's a, that was a fun one. Coming up with them is kind of where it's kind of like, what do you love? And then put it together in a sandwich, right? So. Oh, yeah. And what you've done here is mm -hmm. to bring craft brewing back to the very place where this country's temperance movement got started. Mm -hmm. Why did you do that? It, it wasn't necessarily because of that, but it's, it's here. And if you look at Uptown, it's a fantastic community. We've been dry in, in Westerville to 2005. And before that, if you came into town on a Thursday or even a Wednesday after seven o'clock, there was really nothing going on after the shops closed, right? So there was, uh, it was, the opportunity was here. What were some of the other hurdles that you had to deal with? Because I mean, already you're in the food business, so that's a right. challenge. But you're bringing alcohol to a dry area. For most restaurants to uh, be able to make it, selling beer, or liquor, or wine actually helps a lot because the margins are so slim on the food side. So Westerville is really interesting that it's still technically a dry town. So every uh, place that serves uh, alcohol or liquor has to go on a ballot and get voted wet. So one of the challenges was you go on the ballot and you're not sure if, you, if the community will say yes or no. Fortunately, they, they said yes for us. Looking around at your decor, you actually celebrate the temperance movement and prohibition. Absolutely, if you look, uh, it, it's a celebration of both sides of the movement because if you read about it or watch anything about prohibition, there was two dramatic takes on it. It's not just the moral side, there's a financial side, and uh, Westerville is in the heart of that uh, debate. So we, obviously we lean one way, but we celebrate both sides here. Was there anything that you learned um, about prohibition and the way it changed American culture that's been especially meaningful for you? Well, it's just fascinating, and there's so much to it. Like the income tax, part of the reason we have income tax is when 
uh, prohibition first started, there's a revenue stream that was lost because now there's no more liquor to tax. And then uh, that pivoted it again when the depression hit, the income tax uh, became a lot less because it was a lot less work. And so that's part of the reason the prohibition ended was because the federal government was looking at a way to boost revenue. So they allow the sale again, right? So even here, Westerville is a really good microcosm of that same philosophy because forever we there were no alcohol. And then the uptown area is, is, uh, is thriving now because just a little bit, right? So that balance, I think, is really interesting. You sound like you had to become a historian. Yeah, yeah I became kind of a prohibition nerd uh, doing some <laughs> research here trying to Put it all together, yeah. Westerville in, in particular had a, a gentleman, uh, Henry Corbin, that opened a uh, saloon in 1875 and the townspeople actually bombed uh, the, the saloon on the first night. Oh, so then he rebuilt and they bombed again. And four years later, he built at another site and they totally destroyed that building. And that was it. And then that was the last beer served in, uh, in Westerville to 2005. So in honor of Mr. Corbin, we have a, a beer call here called Corbin's Revenge uh, because we're just trying to get back a little bit for... <laughs> I hear you have another interesting one, though. Tell me about 40-ton Porter. After the initial bombing of Corbin Saloon, the Anti-Saloon League moved their national headquarters here. And on Otterbein's campus now, they had about 11 acres where they built homes and apartments uh, for the higher-ups of the, the movement. Well, they started printing, and if you look at a lot of propaganda, a lot of it was printed here in Westerville. They printed and mailed out 40 tons of uh, propaganda against alcohol out of Westerville. Uh, Westerville was one of the first towns to have a uh, first class post office because of the sheer volume that was coming out. And because of that 40 ton, once circling back again on the history, we are, our porter is called 40 Ton Porter. I gotta give you credit, you have been really imaginative incorporating all of this into your business and making this place a tribute to the history of this area. Well, it, the history is so rich here, which you touched on, that's what we draw our name from. And one thing leads to another, and you see one picture and you read one story, and it takes you uh, down a path that you weren't expecting, and next thing you know, you just find something that's just uh, truly fascinating. So, yeah, we're really, really pleased here. Now, just tell me quickly, what do we have here? This is our summer wheat, our Pilsner, this is an IPA, our Scottish Ale, which is our biggest seller, and our Porter. Here's the Porter. <laughs> this is really an interesting taste. I've had a chance to sample five different flavors here. How many total do you offer here? In a year's period of time, we probably have 20 varieties of beers, uh, five or six different IPAs. Uh, we do a Christmas ale, uh, Oktoberfest, so probably you know 20 different styles. How many batches do you turn out in, say, a month? Our brewery can make four or five batches a month, and uh, and we're fortunate that, that the, the people of Westerville have been really supportive of this place. It, it, we, we, there's times when we struggle to, to keep up with the demand, so it's, it's, a good, it's a good problem to have. That's a common question, you know, what is a microbrewery? Uh, the local Anheuser-Busch brewery on Schrock Road, the amount of beer that they made last year, it would take me 11,000 years in my brewery to make as much beer as they made last year. Incredible, but you get your product is absolutely wonderful. I have to say, thank you, thank you very much. Congratulations on a great product! Oh. Cheers, thank you. Thanks for being with us, and remember, you can catch all of our episodes on ColumbusNeighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app, and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. Wait to shake their heads in time as I say goodbye.
Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarter city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortine Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you.